Jesus. Who is Jesus? That's the question. That's the question. Was he a real person? What did he say? What did he do? What made him so special? What made him different than any other man in history? The records show. His birth was a miracle. His mom was a virgin and she was pregnant. He made the blind see. The deaf hear. The mute speak. The paralyzed walk. He healed terrible diseases. He knew what was in men's minds. He knew what was in men's hearts. He knows what is in men's hearts. He knew the story of people's lives without ever having met them. He spoke with authority. He amazed teachers. He amazed everyone. Nature obeyed him. He turned water into wine. He walked on water. He walked on top of the water. He could change the weather. He fed 5,000 people from one lunchbox. He brought people who were dead back to life. He loved sinners. He loved everyone. 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 He forgave sins. He never made a mistake. He never once sinned. But we judged him. We whipped and beat him. We spit on him. And we killed him. He loved us anyway. He loves us anyway. He died for us. He died so that we wouldn't have to. He paid for our sins with his life. Did I mention he loves us? He came back to life. He was dead. Then he was alive. A lot of people saw him. He is coming back. Who is Jesus? That's a big question. That's the big question. What does it even matter? What does it matter to you? Who is Jesus? My answer doesn't matter to you. Only your answer matters to you. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? Well, <clears throat> I gotta tell you, uh, I've been, I've been hanging out with Jesus for a while now, <laughs> and uh, I am just as excited about him right now as I ever have been. Um, he has radically changed my life. I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. As a matter of fact, I came from a family that told me not to talk about him, don't think about him. If you even mentioned his name in my house, you got in trouble. It was lame. Uh, but he, uh, he cut through all that, and he pursued my heart, and he grabbed a hold of it, and he shook me. And uh, now I'm his, and I'm excited about that. And I hope that you are as well. And uh, I'm, I'm fired up, and I'm ready to tear into God's Word, and, and I'm excited about Jesus, and I'm excited about the Bible, and I'm excited about Revolution Church. I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited about each and every one of you. Every one of you uh, is a story. Every one of you is my friend, and I, I, like, I value you. You're, you're awesome. You guys are awesome. You're, you're my everything right here. This is my everything right here. And I'm excited about what God is doing here at our church. I'm excited that he, he got uh, a hold of us and brought us here to this place. I'm happy uh, about what he did to make this a reality that we're even in this joint is an unbelievable miracle. I can't believe it. It still blows me away. I, I, I'm, I'm shocked. I really am shocked. And I, I shouldn't be. I should be used to it by now. Like, this is what he does. But it freaks me out. He does all this crazy stuff. And I get so fired up. And so we're just, we're just like in the sweet spot of watching Jesus fulfill his promise of building his church. Uh, that's what we're doing. We're partnering with him. We're, we're building Jesus' church. We're, we're lifting him up and we're exalting Jesus Christ. That's what we've been doing in this message series, uh, the Gospel of Luke. That's what Luke did. He told us about Jesus and that's what we're going to do. We want to see him build his church. And so the best way to do it is to, to lift up Jesus and exalt his holy name. And we want to learn who Jesus really is. We don't want to have any false worship. I don't want to worship something I don't know. I don't want to worship something you just kind of tell me about or what grandma said or anything like that or what was on the news. I want to know who the real Jesus is. And so that's what we've been doing. We want to learn who, who Jesus really is. We want to know what he actually taught, not just rumor and hearsay. We want to know what he did, what he does, and what he's going to do. That means he's alive, amen? What he's going to do as time moves on. He's going to do some things. We want to know who the real Jesus is so we could worship him in spirit and in truth. We want to release those God-given emotions and fail feelings that, that, that have been put inside of you so you can yell and scream and clap and cry and woo! 
for Jesus, right? Get excited like you're at the Packer game, man. Get excited for Jesus. You have them all up inside of you, right? But we, we want to make sure that we, we offer those things up to the real God. We don't want to worship something that's not deserving of those, the, that spirit that has been placed in you by him. It's his. He bought you at a price. And so we want to worship him in spirit, but we want to base it on truth, right? Amen? So we learned a lot of things over the last couple of weeks about who Jesus really is, because if you don't know who Jesus really is, you can't really worship him well. So we, did, uh, we, we learned that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. Like, like when Jesus was getting baptized, who's been baptized in here? Anyone? Awesome, right? When, when, when Jesus got baptized, the sovereign Father spoke up from heaven and said, that's my Son. He's, and at the transfiguration, he's up on the hill praying with his disciples. What happens again? He starts glowing, and there's the sovereign voice again. There's my Son. Follow him. He's the son of God. In the scriptures here in Luke, we learned that, that Mary and Joseph, they went looking for Jesus and he had kind of ran off and he's hanging out in the temple and he's learning and he's praying and he's, he's studying the word of God. And he's explaining the word of God and, and, he's, and they're like, what, what, Jesus, why did you go to the, like, you're stressing us out, man. What are you doing? What, where have you been? He's like, well, didn't you know I'd be in the temple, right? But anyway, you've been stressing out your father and I, it says. So he's not only the son of God, but he's also the son of man. He had, he had regular parents with flesh and blood just like us. But we also learn that he's fully God. He's not just the son of God, but he's fully God. The, the fullness of deity was, was, deity was pleased to dwell in Christ in a human body. That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. And he is God. That's the, that's the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He is fully God. He is fully man. And of course he says, well, yeah, I mean, of course I'm, I'm in church. Why wouldn't I be? I'm studying. I'm teaching. I'm learning. I'm sharing God's word. I'm conducting my father's affairs. He teaches us priority. He says the priority of ministry is the most important thing. That's what I'm going to be doing with my time. What did we learn last week? That Christ followers what? Anyone? Amen. Look, she's taking notes. That's how she knows that. That's awesome. Praise God. Great. Christ followers follow Christ. And so Christ is in the temple, and he's sharing God's word, and he's learning God's word, and he's preaching God's word, and he's studying God's word, and he's meditating on God's word. And he says that's the priority. Of course that's where I'm going to be. He also taught us an amazing example of obedience because being about the Father's business means obeying God's commands. And since he, his parents weren't tracking with him, right? Mom, Dad, I, of course I'm in the temple, and, and the Bible says that they didn't understand what he was saying. Did you ever have parents that didn't understand you? Come on, right? Don't leave me up here. Two people, three people. Oh, yeah, that's your dad, dude. Put your hand down. <laughs> Donnie Triller. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, didn't, they weren't tracking with him, so he's teaching them this stuff, and they're like, what? But even though they didn't understand, even though they weren't tracking with Jesus, he still, it says, he was obedient to his parents because he was being obedient to his daddy. And so the Bible says, right, he's the teacher of God's word. He wrote it. He, he, it says that we're to honor our mother and father. So even though his parents weren't tracking with him, he honored his mother and father because he was honoring his father. So he teaches us obedience. Obedience. We also learned that others... Uh, can, can, can talk about Jesus. Others can look uh, out across the, the brokenness of people and, and see that they need some help. And, and John the Baptist saw that. And he said, listen, you got to repent. And you got to turn to Jesus. Right? He was pointing people to Jesus. And every week I get up here and I do the same thing. It's not about me. I'm just a regular old dude. But, but Jesus, look to Jesus. He can help you. He can help you. But I can't really help you. And it's only Jesus Christ who can infuse you with his Holy Spirit to break the, the, the addictions in your life and to, 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 to dissolve the, 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 the guilt and the shame and the brokenness in your life and to, and to restore marriages and restore relationships and restore health and all those things that we want and crave and need. It's only Jesus Christ who can do that. No man can do that. Victory over all things is found in Jesus Christ the Lord. We also realize that building Jesus' church 
requires that the church of Jesus worships Jesus. Right? That's not anything too fancy, right? But it's true. The, the, the church, to, to build Jesus' church, you have to worship Jesus. And so we did this, this sermon, What's Up With Mary? And we did What's Up With Joseph? Because these are people that falsely, there's some people that falsely elevate them beyond what God's word would say. And so they're, they're not to be worshipped, but they're to be looked at as an amazing examples of faith that we could look to to help ourselves. And so, let me ask you this. Last week's question. It's the most important question you'll ever hear. It's the most important question you'll ever answer. Who is Jesus to you? Because really, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything what I think. It doesn't make any difference what you think, or what you think, or what you think in my life. I have to make my own decision, right? Just like you. All of us have to make a decision on who you say Jesus is. And I'm just going to tell you, just so you know, so you don't walk out of here going, well, he never told me. He is the only one to be worshipped. That's it. That's who Jesus Christ is. Just in case you wanted to know. So tonight, since we've done what's up with Mary and what's up with Joseph and what's up with Jesus, let's, let's do what's up with the Bible. Let's talk about the Bible. The reason why I want to talk about the Bible is because we're a Bible church. Every week, that's what we do, right? We come in here, we tear open the Bible, and we read God's Word, and we hear what it says, and we let it speak over our lives, and we sit under its authority. Whatever we do here, it's, it's because God's Word said so. That's what we're supposed to do. That's it. We rip open the Bible every single week. It's a biggie. It's a big and important thing. So if we're going to come every single week and sit under the authority of something, let's find out what Jesus, right? We're worshiping Jesus. Let's find out what Jesus teaches about the Bible itself. Can we do that? Because it doesn't matter what I think about the Bible. It doesn't matter what Gunhammer thinks about the Bible. It matters what Jesus says about it, because that's who we're to follow. Amen? So let's find out about the Bible from Jesus' perspective. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see what Jesus teaches in the Bible, and then we're going to talk about what Jesus thinks about the Bible. Okay, And we're going to find that, uh, the text we're going to look at tonight, some of you may know it very, very well. It's when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the desert, in the wilderness. And it's found in Luke chapter 4. So while you're turning there, um, we're going to read that in a minute. But while you're turning there, I'm just going to say that tonight's um, uh, spirit and truth pursuit is going to be, uh, what does Jesus actually teach? Okay, so it's not just hearsay or assumption or, or gossip or I heard that Jesus did this or I heard that Jesus did that. Let's, let's find out exactly what Jesus teaches. And, and again, like a couple weeks ago, this is not um, Jesus from the pulpit. There'll be lots of that in Luke. There'll be lots of him standing up in front of people, just like I'm doing right now, and teaching the people specific things. But that's not what this is. What this is, is, is the normal flow of Jesus' life that he did some stuff that teaches us what we ought to do. Amen? And so we see that here in this section of Scripture. So uh, if, you, if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, please open up to Luke 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them there on the tables. Please uh, open one up. Put your eyes on God's Word. Don't just assume that I'm reading it correctly. I could mess it up. Um, just please read God's Word. And I hope that before the end of the night, you too will realize the absolute treasure, the treasure that you have available at your hands. You guys ready to read? Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Uh, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. So he just got baptized in the Jordan River. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. I don't know exactly what happened because it was like a dove, but he's full of the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's Jesus Christ in the flesh now, filled like there's not an ounce of him that doesn't have total God all up in him, okay? He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He returns from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Now, before I read on, I just got to say this, because you might just need to hear this too. Because you've heard it said, I'm sure if you've been in church at all, to, to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard that, anyone? Anyone? Okay. okay, that's something you should probably pray every single morning. It'd be a great idea. 
Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Like, purge out the junk, fill me with you, because I want to do what you want, right? That's a good prayer? Okay, well, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, and this, this lesson right here will teach you that being filled with the Holy Spirit and therefore being led by the Holy Spirit doesn't always mean it's going to work out good for you, right? Okay, he's, he, it's not like being filled with the Holy Spirit, he won the lottery, being, being filled with the Holy Spirit, my wife cooks my favorite dinner every night for the rest of my life. Like that, that, that's not what it says. It says he was, being, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit down into the desert, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You say, so I just want you to see some truth so we could worship him in spirit. Now during this time it says, Jesus ate nothing at all. And he became very hungry. Someone say, duh. Right? Okay, I get that. Um, then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. And, but Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Uh, then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So, so, so like everything, that, every kingdom that there ever was and ever will be is now on display for Jesus to see. And, and the devil says, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. And Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Or serve only him, pardon me. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, here's, here's the devil quoting scripture. That should scare you right there. That should, that, should, that should catch your attention. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. There's so much there. We could talk about this for a month. But I'm just going to talk about three things. Here's the first thing that I, I want observation I want to share with you. And you can, if you take notes, you can jot this down. Our most pressing needs aren't the most pressing. Okay? Our most pressing needs are not the most pressing. I'm going to share some things with you tonight. And, I, and, and, it's, and, and they're not easy. But I, I just want to tell you this, that... that we at this church, okay, if you're part of this church, you need to know this, that this church, we are interested in making disciples of Jesus Christ, not just filling seats, okay? And so we got to get through some hard work sometimes. Sometimes the, 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 the truth of God's word from cover to cover, the full counsel of God is not always easy. But remember, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit was led out into the wilderness, and sometimes we need to go out in the wilderness to learn some things, okay? Our most pressing needs aren't the most pressing. 40 days, let me, let me ask you, how many people in here right now are hungry? Just raise your hand. About well, 50% of you are hungry. I'm going to pick on somebody. Hannah? Well, you're pregnant. That's not fair. Okay, so you're hungry? When did you eat last? 15 minutes ago? Awesome. Who else is hungry? You're hungry? Well, how long ago did you eat? Half an hour ago. Robbie, how, are you hungry? You hungry? You had a cookie a minute ago. Okay. Who else is hungry? Go ahead. How long ago did you eat? Three hours ago. Bordering on respectful. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Right? No, 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 listen. Very few of us really know what it means to be really hungry. We live in America, right? It's pretty good here. It's pretty good, right? I, listen, I, I, I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you some truth. I have done some fasting in my life. 
And, and I fasted for 24 hours. I fasted, I think the most I've ever fasted was maybe three days. At the third day, you don't want to be around me. Okay? Okay, so, so, but here's the thing. Three days. You're hungry, dude. Jesus Christ did not eat for 40 days. You ate a minute ago. Maybe a hall pass because you're prego, but you ate 15 minutes ago, right? 40 days without eating anything. So, so you're a smart bunch. You are. Just what would you think would be the pressing need, right? When you haven't eaten in 40 days. Well, some need, right? I mean, let, let, don't be all super spiritual. No, what we need is the Lord. No, don't I want to hear that. I want to hear the truth. When we're super, super hungry, when you're driving down the road and you're hungry, you're not going, you know what? I just need some more of the Lord. You're like, no, dude, where's the Hardee's? Right? I mean, come on, right? McDonald's. Right? So, so that's what we're thinking. 40 days without eating. And what could have Jesus said, yeah, I'm hungry. And, and would you have faulted him? Would, would that have made a bad story? No. But he makes a point here. He makes a point. And it's for you. And it's for me. Man cannot live on bread alone. And the full thought is expanded on in Matthew where he says, man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word of God. On every word of God. The greatest need of the human soul is not food, water, clothing, and shelter. It's this. It's the Word of God. This is, this is undisputable. This is what Jesus Christ the Lord has said. That man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word of God. You realize the importance of what you have in your hand. I don't think most of us do. It's not so much what God can give you and all and it's it's god's word that gives life and we need it and that's why we rip open the bible here every week because it's important and jesus said so and so that's why we rip open the bible and read it every year because your soul needs nourishment to live healthy and so you need the word of god and that's why we do this every single week here's another thing just going to jump to the next one real quick the uh, just say this that the Offerings of the world are off. The offerings of the world are off. Power and prestige and position and possessions. These are the things that, listen, they're not bad. These are the things that most of us, including myself, that's generally the pursuit of my everyday life. You know, we want to climb the corporate ladder. We want to expand our business. We want to make a little bit more money. We want to have a nicer home, maybe go on a nice vacation. Like, these are good things. We should pursue those things. God has given you a mind and passions and talents and strength and abilities, and you should use them for those things except when they begin to lord over you. And, and, and when those things, when th those things that are good, when, when they begin to dictate your schedule, and they begin to dictate your thoughts, and they get, begin to dictate your checkbook, and your time, and, and your perspectives, and your priorities become those things. They are now the Lord of your life. And the Bible says, Jesus says it, that, that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. And so when the pursuits of those things become the, 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 the schedule maker of your life, Jesus Christ is no longer your Lord. Those things are. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, that it says, Do not love this world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, now listen, loved ones. I told you we had to do some hard work, right? This is hard. Because most of us, truth be known, in America, we're pursuing things. Good things. But those good things become the main thing. And when the main thing becomes the main, when th one of those things, it says that you don't have the love of the Father in you. 
Here's what the, this is what the 1 John 2.15 goes on to say about what those things are. The lust of the eyes, the things that I see and I want them, right? Possessions. Physical pleasures. You know what, that, that word pleasure there is the word where we get the word hedonism. Self-fulfillment to the max with no stop and no regard. That's America. That's what we do. That's what we do. And the pride in achievement and possessions. So the first thing is, is the things I see, i got to have them. And then there's the things that I, I want to make me feel good, i got to have them. And then once I have them, then it's like, hey, look what I have. Look at me. Look what I have. Look at my stuff. Look what I've achieved. Look at my stuff. Look at my house. Look at my career. Look at the company I built. Look at my checkbook. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. And the Bible says if that's your Lord, if that's what's dictating your life, you don't have the love of the Father in you. Let me ask you a question, uh, not to scare you, but to, to do some introspection. Uh, if you're saved, would you say that the love of the Father is in you? Yes. It's yes. So it's time to evaluate your life. A proper relationship with the Lord would have the love of the Father in you. And so it's time to maybe look at those things and, and ask, are those the things that are lording my life or is Jesus the Lord of my life? And so you see in this text that, that the devil offers Jesus the epitome of worldly successes. All that we would ever care to have or want or desire or pursue is all offered up to Jesus. But to have those things, what did the text say? You had to shift your allegiance from Jesus to the enemy, the one who's in charge of this world, who's in charge of all that stuff. You just listen. You just have to shift your allegiance, that's all. Just shift your allegiance and let these things be the Lord of your life. I'll give you everything you ever wanted. You can have it so much you can choke on it. And I'll continue to give it to you. Just shift your allegiance from the Lord Jesus to the Lord of paycheck and pleasure and physical and all these other things that we think that we want. But Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You can't. When James, his half-brother, would say it differently, but very much the same, he says, a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea, and he is unsettled in everything that he does. He is unstable, pardon me, in everything that they do. So Jesus, in no uncertain terms, tells the enemy that nothing this world can offer can possibly substitute for God. Nothing in this world can replace God. Verse 8, you must worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Uh, the third illustration, I don't have a fancy little catchphrase for you. The, the third illustration that I think this text teaches is, the best way to intro it is, is a couple of verses. Um, there's a couple of verses in the Bible that people struggle with, and I struggle with them too. They're pretty famous stuff. Uh, Sort of like uh, in the Gospel of John when he says, uh, uh, John 15, um, if, I abide in, you know, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask for anything and you'll receive it. Right? Sounds pretty good. Matthew 18, 19, if two of you here on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Sounds pretty good, right? Jared, would you do me a favor? Can you come here? <clears throat> Some translations will say that if any two people here touch in agreement on anything, right, it'll be given to them, right? Just, this is not, seriously, we talk. Okay, we're going we're gonna to agree on something right now, okay? Um, I'm a little low on cash right now. I mean, I'm not joking, I'm serious. I'm a little low on cash right now. So I want to I wanna ask, ask the Lord for something. Um, Lord, um, and I want you to agree with me so we can have it. I believe, Lord, that if you would give me an ounce of black heroin, I could sell it real quick, and, and I could get the money I need. Wait a minute now. What, why? God, thank you. So you all realize the stupidity of this, right? So, so what's wrong? Is, it, is, 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 is the Bible wrong? I mean, it, right? If, we, if, if he agreed, if he agreed, 
with me and we touch an agreement, it should be my Father in heaven shall give it to me. I mean, that's what the Bible says, right? Is, is the Bible wrong? No, it's not wrong. What's wrong? Right. What was wrong there? Point to what was wrong. Yeah. My request was stupid. That was what's wrong. So, 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 so the problem is, is that God has a nature and, and a character about him, and, and he has a way of conducting his universe, and so we can't create some God in our image, and we could try to impose what we want on the sovereign God and go, well, that's what the Bible says. We, we agreed on something here on earth, so it should be given to me. No, that's not the way it works. This is the way I think it should work, God. This is what, what I want you to do, God, but I, but I think you should. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. You, do you, has anyone read the book of Job? Why, like, why would he even put that in the Bible, right? I wouldn't put it in the Bible. That's a horrible book because God has a way of doing things. He has a way of doing things. It, it's just the way he does it. We can't impose what we think upon the Lord. He has his ways. And so we can't come to God with some silly thing like this. The book of James says you don't receive because you ask wrongly. You ask wrongly. God is the giver of good gifts, right? He's not a giver of bad gifts. So even though we agree on something, we think that it's best. That doesn't necessarily mean it is best for you. God is the giver of good gifts. He doesn't give bad gifts. If you ask God for, what does it say, for bread, does he give you a scorpion? He doesn't want to give you bad gifts. He wants to give you good gifts that honor him and bless you. And Jesus confronts this type of foolishness in this third rebuke here of the devil. The devil says, jump off the temple. God will send angels. He misquotes the Bible. That's not, what, that's not what God wants for us. To take some foolishness and attach a Bible verse to it and say, see, that's not the way it works. Jump off the temple. God will send angels. And Jesus says, don't test God. And then the devil flees. Why does the devil flee? Because he gets found out. He gets called out. I like that. He's a weak con. Yeah. It's a, that is good. He's a weak con. But, but listen, greater than that is that, the, is that Jesus Christ is not, does not have divided loyalty. Jesus Christ is not double-minded. Jesus Christ knows the truth, and you can know the truth, and the truth can set you free. Okay, So, so that's why the devil has to flee, because he, he's got nowhere to go. He, he knows there's no in on Jesus. And, and you know what's amazing? He, he, is, he is 40 days starving, right? Starving. And he doesn't just get tempted by, by some bad situation or maybe even a little demon or something like that. I'm not saying there's a demon behind every rock, but a demon could come, right? No, he is staring into the face of Satan himself. Like he is right there staring into evil's face. And he says, no, you have no in here. Out. And he leaves. That's the way he wants us to be. That's the way he wants us to be. You can... Do you, do you believe you can be that? You can. You can. Jesus taught that God is what we need. We need him most for him to lead us. And again, here in this lesson, he teaches us priorities and obedience as well. Now this section of, of Luke chapter 4, uh, this is the part I really wanted to get to. That other stuff was just... Uh, working our way into it, but this right here, uh, this normal flow of Jesus' life, he's not at the pulpit, he's not in the temple, he's not on the mountain teaching people, he's just, just living his life out, and his life is an amazing example for us, but this text right here in Luke chapter 4 contains uh, an extremely powerful statement from Jesus on, on the power and the authority and the importance of of God's word, of God's word. Uh, there's a lot, let me just say this, there's a lot of teaching. I, I, I don't know if it's been going on for a long time or if maybe I'm just being made aware 
of it. But there's a lot of teaching within the church of Jesus Christ that talks about this new revelation. This, you want new revelation. You want, you want, you want to hear that, that somehow the conversation that you would have with God would somehow surpass in importance the conversation that you would have with God here. And, and I hear it a lot in teaching. It's really disturbing to my spirit. And, and somehow when you, when you elevate the... Uh, I, want to, I want to make sure I say this right just so... That, I, our ears are tender. Mine is. Mine is our too. Sometimes when you have that discussion, that that this new revelation is the most important thing, you sort of decrease the value and the importance of God's word here. D- does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So so I, and I want to I want to make sure that you that you understand that that should not be the case okay so you, you might some people are saying the book is good but but new revelation is somehow superior um john macarthur i want to read something that john macarthur wrote he is a he has a way of of of, of explaining things in such a way he's a uh, one of the most famous uh, well-respected uh, theologians and commentators on the planet okay that this guy is amazing. And this is what he said about God's Word. God's Word is sufficient to meet every need of the human soul, as David verifies frequently in his Psalms. Psalm 19, 7 through 14, is the most comprehensive statement regarding the sufficiency of Scripture. It is an inspired statement about Scripture as a qualified guide for every situation. Scripture is comprehensive, containing everything necessary for one's spiritual life. Scripture is surer than a human experience that one may look to in proving God's power and presence. Scripture contains divine principles that are the best guide for character and conduct. Scripture is lucid rather than mystifying so that it enlightens the eyes. Scripture is void of any flaws and therefore lasts forever. Scripture is true regarding all things that matter, making it capable of producing comprehensive righteousness. Because it meets every need in life, Scripture is infinitely more precious than anything this world has to offer. I'd like for you to turn your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to talk about what the Bible says of itself. And this is extremely important. If you get nothing else, get this tonight. Please put your eyes on, on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. Just holler when, you, when you're there. Okay? Here it is. And it's on the screen if you don't have your Bible. All Scripture is God-breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. Some translations will say fully equipped for every good work. That is huge importance. All scripture, that means cover to cover. Genesis to Revelation is God breathed. Do you know when he, breathed, when he spoke, he breathed out of his mouth, the planets came out. So in that same way, he breathed and this word came out. Every bit of it is from the Lord. And, 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 and its use, listen to this, listen carefully. Its use is to thoroughly equip. Now let me ask you a question. You're all intelligent. How much is lacking if you're thoroughly equipped? Show me. Zero, okay? Everything you need to do what good work? Every good work. So every single thought, word, action, perspective, priority, every single quality that God wants to instill in you so you can be conformed into the image of his son is found right here. Right here. To, to do every single thing that God wants 
before the foundations of the earth for you to do is found right in the scriptures. Do you realize the, the treasure that you have at your disposal? And listen, if you have come to church, if you have prayed, if you have done anything in an effort to be, to be obedient to the Lord, to be like the Lord, anything, it's all right here. If it's not found here, to be fully equipped for every good work, every single thing, right here in God's Word. And that's why we rip the Bible open here every single week and teach from it. That's what we do. That's what we do. Now listen, three times the devil tempts Jesus Christ. Three times. And, and Jesus, who by the way has all the authority in heaven and earth, Jesus, he could have said anything he wanted to. So the devil comes up to him and, and says, hey, make these, make these stones uh, bread. What could he have said? Throw some up here. Beat it, buddy. Could have said that, right? Would it, would it, listen, no matter what Jesus would have said, would it have worked? Yes? He's, he's God, right? The mountains shake before him. The demons run and flee. You sang it. So it doesn't matter what he said. He could have said anything out of his mouth. He says, hey, buddy, hit the road, hamburger. And it would have worked. Because he's Jesus Christ. And all creation must submit to his authority, right? He could have said anything he wanted to to have victory over the devil. But he didn't. He quoted the Bible. He, Jesus Christ quoted the Bible. <laughs> he, he wasn't just having a, a day that he would say, well, I'm just in a melancholy mood. I'm just kind of down. You know? yeah. Wasn't just having a rough day. Just need a little bump in the spirit, you know. One of them good verses. Woo! He was, fa he was looking face to face at the devil himself. Like this is the greatest challenge any human being could ever have. He's staring into the face of the devil. And what does he do? He quotes scripture. Does that indicate to you the importance of what you have in your hand? Paul would call it the sword of the spirit. God's word, the Bible, the scriptures. And listen, not just quoted. If he had just quoted, devil... Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word of God. That would have been good enough, right? But he didn't. He said, hold on a second. He, he didn't just quote the scripture. He referenced the scripture. Why did he do that? Point to who he did it for. You. To let you know of the importance of God's word in your life. God's word is everything to me. It's, the, it's, 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 a, it's an absolute treasure. It's, my, it's what I'm basing my whole life on is on God's word. And, and I, want, I would love to see this church be a, a filled with people who are so passionate about God's word that they, they chew it up and they find life in God's word. Life in God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is alive and powerful. Alive and powerful. You could see it glowing on your tabletop right now. So let me ask you this. Uh, in what way is the word of God powerful? Well, here's a couple of ways. You can jot these down if you'd like. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. I would love to hear just those pages turning because you're feeling like, man, I, God's word is amazing. I want to read God's word. I want to read God's word. What do you got for me, man? What do we got? I need life. I need something. What do we got? That's a sweet sound right there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Um, For you have been born again. You know, that's just like you're saved, right? You're born again. Anyone here born again? I'm born again. I was dead, now I'm alive, right? 
We've accepted Jesus. What does it say here? It says, uh, For you have been born again, not to a life that will quickly end, for your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. It's got the power here to save you. It has the power to save you. And this is a reference actually to the Word of God, not the word of the word when Jesus is referred to as the word it's capital w look at first uh, in John chapter 1 when the word was with god and the word was god and the word became flesh that's capital that's yahweh that's 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 the lord right this is the word of god that has the power to save you and that's why we rip open the bible every week so you know what it means to be saved you know how to get there to offer up the gospel to you so that you can no longer be lost and hurting and suffering but to be saved that's why we're here. That's why we open the Bible every week. Here's another thing. There's another reason why it's powerful. It can sustain you. Look at Romans 10, 17. Let's hear them Bible pages turning. Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. So, so how does our relationship with Jesus deepen and last through life's challenges? By hearing the word of God. And that's why we open up the Bible every single week and chew on God's word every single week to strengthen you so your faith can grow in God for a lifetime. And that's why we open up the word of God. Here's the third thing, the third reason why it's powerful. It gives me hope for a better future. Psalm 119, verse 114. Psalm 119 has more references to the Word of God than anywhere else in the Bible. Psalm 119, verses, verse 114 says this, You are my refuge, and my shield. Your word is my source of hope. My source of hope is not found in a football team. My source of hope is not found in my family. My source of hope is not found in my church. My source of hope is not found in a politician. My source of hope is not found in a job. My source of hope is found in God's word. That's what it says. You are my refuge and my shield. Your word is my source of hope. And that's why we rip open the Bible every week. Because God knows life is difficult. And since the fall, he, he wants us to know that, that for those who accepted him, that there's a better future up ahead. And so that's why we rip open the Bible every week. Here's the fourth thing. It shows me the best way to live. Much like a car has a service manual, we have one also. Psalm 119, verse 105. This is a popular one. You may know it. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. If you look at verse 133, it also says that your word guides me so that I won't be overcome by evil. If the devil is, the Bible says that the devil is prowling around like a lion trying to pounce on you, right? Like, so if you know that to be the case, let, well, how about this? God's word's going, hey, that, the devil's over there. Don't go down there. D don't go down that road, dude. That's a bad road. He's, he's giving you a, a lamp in front of you so you know which way to go, so you won't be overcome by evil, and you won't fall into sin's trap. And, and the, God's word, if meditated on and planted into your heart, would keep you from sinning against the Lord. He'll take you down the best street of blessing and life. And that's why we rip open the Bible every week. To keep you from the sticky fingers of the evil one so you might walk in the fullness of life. And that's why we read God's word. Here's the fifth thing. God's word inspires worship. Inspires worship. Look at Psalm 119 verses 171 and 172. I hope that as I... Uh, reference these scripture verses 
that in time, the, the, the heart that's in here right now that goes, oh, another one, begins to go, oh, I can't wait for the next one. That I'm refreshed. Give me more, Moses. Give me more word. I need more of the word of God. Don't stop. Verses 171 and 172. Listen, I can't come up with anything better than this. Right? Listen, let praise flow from my lips, for you have taught me your decrees. Let my tongue sing about your word, for all your commands are right. The word of God inspires worship. So we start reading the Bible. We, we dabble a little bit in obedience and then wham, a promise of God comes true in your life. And you're like, wow. He, he's not just this God my grandma talked about. He's real. He's powerful. He loves me. He wants good for me. He said, if I do this, I'll do th- he'll do that. And I did it and he did. Woo! That's awesome. Right? That's awesome. And what, what happens then? It begins to snowball. And you want, look, I, you said to do that? I want to do that too. And they're like, oh, give me more. Right? And you just start loving it. And all of a sudden, these stories that your grandma used to tell you, you open up the Bible, you're like, whoa, you opened the Red Sea. Woo! You walked on water. You calmed the storm. You fed, you fed 5,000 people. It's not just a story anymore in Sunday school with the flannel board. It's like, you're real, God. Woo! I love you. Like, that's what it does when you, when you read God's word. That's what it should do. It inspires worship of the one who reads it. Old Bible stories come alive. Tongues of fire dropping down on people's heads. You're you're healing lepers. The ten plagues. You calm the storm. You you raise dead people. It's not just a story anymore. It's like, woo! You start worshiping. That's what the Word of God does. You start singing. Your praise will ever be on my lips. And that's why we rip open the Bible every week, to proclaim the greatness of our God every single week. Psalm 96, listen to these words, let them sink in. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. That should be on our lips all the time. Here's the last thing. God's word is true and always relevant. Some people go, well, that was a book from, you know, 2,000 years ago. It's not really, you know, today's... Things have changed. Things have changed. <laughs> is it a, let me ask you a question. Is it a man thing? Or, or is it across the board that, that people like stuff that you can count on? It's across the board? Because, I mean, I know, I, like, guys, if you, help me here, like, you look at mom, you're like, don't throw away those sneakers. There's more hole than leather. Don't, don't ch- and, and then you, did you ever get home and your favorite jeans are in the garbage and you just melt down, lose it? Come on now, I saw a hug. That happened, right? Yeah? Right, you just like stuff that you can count on, right? A good, listen, who's got old tools in the, in the shed that you just, you haven't used them in a thousand years, but you just don't get rid of them because someday you might need it, right? You just love that thing. A, a faithful dog, uh, a favorite pair of jeans or, or shoes, a trustworthy friend. Listen, I, I don't, I'm not building my life on fads or trends or opinions, okay? We're here to make disciples of Jesus Christ, remember, not to fill seats. So look at Psalm 119, verse 160. Man, I love sharing the Bible with you guys. Thank you so much. The very essence of your word is truth. All your just regulations will stand forever. And that's why we rip open the Bible every week. Because you need some bedrock to build a life on. 
And, and you don't need some dude coming up here making up some creative, funny stuff that sounds spiritual. Do you, do you understand the truth that you have in your hands? Do you understand the treasure that you have at your disposal? God's word gives life and it sustains you and it creates worship in, in the worshiper's heart because we're all going to worship something and this, my friends, my loved ones, this will, will guide your worship to the right place, to Jesus Christ the Lord. You need the rock of God's word for salvation, for encouragement to grow in faith, to give you hope, to protect you from evil and sin and to help you worship the only one who deserves your spirit to be released to him. The word of God completes the man of God. He, he, bless you. He, he, it completes the woman of God, fully equipping them for every good work. That's the word of God. Jesus authored the Bible, but he also read the Bible. He also quoted the Bible, and he also referenced the Bible Jesus loves the Bible, and his hope and my hope is that you will love the Bible as well. This is the greatest treasure that's ever been given to the human race, right here. It's God's word. It leads to salvation. It leads to worship. It sustains life. It encourages you. It gives you hope. Listen, you're, you're, you're in a... Who, who's, who's had a tough week? Come on. Tough week, man. Universal. Right? Aren't you just getting beat down like crazy all the time? Man, crack open God's Word. I don't know what else to tell you, man. Just crack open God's Word and find some hope. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like Prego, man. It's in there. It's in there. Can I ask the worship team to, to come back up? And I don't know what they're going to do, but listen. One of the things I share with you is that God's word inspires worship, right? Amen. Inspires worship. Well, I just shared with you the full text of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness by the devil. I, I read God's word to you. I shared verses about hope and salvation and faith and protection from evil. I shared all that stuff with you. you. Most of you actually opened up your Bible or your device and you read it. Would you, would you let God's Spirit take that word that you just read and stir up a worship in you right now? Would you, would, you allow, would you allow that to happen? See, you have to allow the Lord to do that. This, this is your part. This is when you, the, the Bible says to let God transform you into a new person by letting him change you, by letting him change the way you think. So, so we have to allow God's spirit to take that word that you just heard and, 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 and allow him to inspire worship in you. So, so only because I love you and I want the best for you, honestly, is that I, I just want that to happen. I want you to experience a worship time with the Father when you actually can reach up to heaven and touch Him and, and, and experience Him reaching down and touching you. Can, you. can you close your eyes for a minute? Can you envision that? Come on, everyone be prophetic right here, right now. Right? You can do it. Just envision that right now. Envision reaching up and touching your dad. And if you want to, look, I see hands going up in the sanctuary. If you want to literally do it, all eyes are closed. You can reach up and touch your daddy right now. And maybe it means you're reaching up because he's reaching down and you just want to take him by the hand. Let, let, let the word of God mixed some supernatural way with the Spirit of God. Let worship swell up inside of you. If you want to stand up and sing, stand. If you want to sit, sit, whatever you want. But don't let this moment go. It's a moment that God is giving you right now. It's His gift to you 
to experience his very presence. Take advantage of that. I love you.